Hey everyone, welcome back to Nurse Crit. My name is Jason. I'm an acute care nurse practitioner. Can you think of a body part that is stiff and leaky? Oh jeez, you nasty nurse. I know what you were thinking. I was talking about a broken aortic valve. Shush. Let me just say, your aortic valve is so important, you do not want one that is stiff or leaky, or you will end up quite sick and quite miserable. The objectives for this video are to review the function of the aortic valve, discuss diagnostic testing for valve pathology, describe the pathophysiology of aortic stenosis and insufficiency, and explain the medical management for each. First, let's briefly talk about normal physiology. Your circulatory system is a continuous, closed network of blood vessels, basically a bunch of pipes, that carry blood throughout your entire body. It is designed so that the blood can only flow in one direction. When your heart squeezes, blood is forcefully ejected forward with a high pressure where it flows through the large aorta and progresses through smaller and smaller arteries, arterioles, and capillaries. It then ends up on the venous side where it flows at a much lower pressure through the venules, veins, and vena cava where it then returns to refill the heart. It is critical that blood only flows in one direction, so in order to prevent any retrograde flow or backflow, the body has a bunch of one-way valves. There are four one-way valves in the heart and many more throughout all of your veins. Every single heart valve is equally important, but today I am only going to discuss the aortic valve since it is the one that is most commonly diseased and can cause the greatest amount of pathology in the body. The aortic valve is normally a three leaflet valve that sits between the left ventricle and the aorta. It opens during systole and it closes during diastole. So a normally functioning valve does not interfere with forward flow and it should prevent any backward flow. But there are congenital and acquired conditions that can negatively affect the function of the aortic valve. Some people are born with a bicuspid valve in which there are only two leaflets instead of three. As people age, sometimes calcifications can form which stiffen or narrow the valve. Infections or autoimmune conditions like endocarditis or rheumatic heart disease can damage the valves. Traumatic injuries or aortic aneurysms and dissections are a few other causes of aortic valve pathology. And of course, the usual cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, obesity, and smoking can also contribute to valvular heart disease. When the aortic valve does not open or close properly for whatever reason, that is when bad things start to happen in the body. When the valves become stenotic, it cannot open properly, which is a disease state known as aortic stenosis. And the opposite problem, when the valve does not close completely, causing blood to leak backwards, is known as aortic regurgitation. I will discuss the pathophysiological effects of each condition shortly. When the aortic valve starts to become stiff or leaky, one of the many physical exam findings you might encounter is a murmur. The absence of a murmur does not rule out valve disease, but its presence does increase the likelihood that there is a valve problem. A murmur can originate from any of the four valves, but in terms of the aortic valve only, when auscultating the chest, if you hear a murmur during systole, you are likely hearing aortic stenosis. And conversely, if you hear a murmur during diastole, you are likely dealing with aortic regurgitation. Sometimes you might even hear a murmur during systole and diastole, which could be a combination of both conditions. Beware that faint systolic murmurs can actually be a normal finding in some circumstances. However, a diastolic murmur is always considered to be abnormal. So if you ever appreciate a diastolic heart murmur, you should notify the physician so they can investigate further. And the way we investigate and definitively diagnose a dysfunctional heart valve is with an echocardiogram. Using echocardiography, we can look at the physical structure of the heart and valves, as well as determine the flow through the valve. The echo helps to quantify the severity of disease, but since this is a nursing channel, I will not go into the diagnostic criteria. We will leave that to the cardiologists. Now on to the meat of this video, the pathophysiology of aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. Let's first start with aortic stenosis. Normally, the aortic valve opens easily during systole and does not create any significant resistance. 
if you are familiar with hemodynamics, you know that the afterload of the heart or the pressure that the ventricle must pump against is the systemic vascular resistance or SVR. In normal circumstances, the systemic vascular resistance and afterload are essentially the same thing. The SVR is the determinant of the afterload. If the SVR is high, then the afterload is high, and the heart has to work harder to push blood forward. If the SVR is low, then afterload is low, and the heart has an easy time pushing blood forward. Since SVR can be variable, the afterload is also variable. Because the aortic valve anatomically sits between the left ventricle and the aorta, if it becomes stenotic, meaning the opening gets smaller and unable to open all the way, it now becomes the primary determinant of afterload for the heart. Imagine that circular-shaped valve becomes so calcified that now the opening is nothing more than a small slit. You can probably imagine that it's going to take a lot more force by the ventricle to push blood through that narrow opening. It creates a fixed and constant resistance. Since the SVR is the pressure behind the valve, it becomes much less significant now. If the SVR is low, it doesn't matter because the stenotic aortic valve is still dictating the afterload. But if the SVR is higher than the resistance of the valve, then it becomes the determinant of afterload once again. In case that wasn't clear, let's say the stenotic valve causes X amount of resistance. If the SVR past the valve is less than X, it does not affect the afterload of the heart. Only if the SVR is higher than X will it provide added resistance. So what are the consequences of this constantly high afterload in aortic stenosis? Well, the body is incredibly amazing and has a whole bunch of ways to compensate. These adaptations are great in the short term, but when they continue on for prolonged periods of time, they actually start to be maladaptive and problematic. So the consequences. First, aortic stenosis creates increased pressure in the left ventricle as it needs higher pressures in order to push blood past the narrowed valve. In order to generate these stronger forces, the heart muscle starts to hypertrophy, like any other muscles that you work out really hard. As the myocardium starts to hypertrophy, rather than bulking outward due to limited space, it tends to bulk inward, which starts to make the space in the ventricle smaller. This means less blood volume can fit in the left ventricle, which naturally decreases the stroke volume and cardiac output. When the heart is less able to fill with blood, this is called diastolic dysfunction. This makes preload, or the volume of blood in the ventricle, super important. Patients with aortic stenosis are very preload dependent, and just a little hypovolemia or vasodilation can really have severe negative consequences on your hemodynamics. And conversely, giving just a little bit too much volume can overfill the ventricle and make your blood pressure shoot way up. It can be tricky trying to find that Goldilocks preload amount. Since you know that preload is super important, you usually want to keep the patient's heart rate on the lower side to allow for more diastolic filling. Tachycardia is bad because the heart doesn't have enough time to fill. The other important mechanism to allow for maximal preload in the ventricle is atrial kick, which accounts for about 20-30% to of the total diastolic volume. This means that AFib is bad, and AFib with RVR is really bad. And the greatest irony is that patients with aortic valve pathology are at much higher risk for developing AFib. Another consequence of high afterload from the aortic valve, it creates a dysregulated pressure gradient in the coronary arteries. Please watch my video on coronary perfusion pressure for a more detailed explanation. When the pressure gradients get all discombobulated, especially when the ventricular pressures are high and the systemic pressure is low, you start to get decreased perfusion to the heart. Remember that thicker heart muscle that is more prone to beating irregular and fast? Not only does it require more blood than normal, it's unfortunately receiving less blood than normal. A greater demand with a decreased supply is a recipe for physiologic disaster. In order to maintain adequate coronary perfusion, 
you often will need to keep the systemic blood pressure on the slightly higher side to maintain proper pressure gradients. Any drop in BP will cause an ischemic hit to the heart. So patients with aortic stenosis, hypotension, bad, hypovolemia, bad, AFib, bad, and tachycardia, bad. Now let's move on to the opposite problem, aortic regurgitation or aortic insufficiency. These two terms are considered synonymous, so I will refer to aortic insufficiency as AI from this point forward. AI is a pathophysiological state in which the aortic valve does not close properly and results in blood getting ejected normally during systole, but flowing back during diastole. Earlier in the video, I stated that blood is only supposed to go in one direction, forward. When blood starts to flow backward, it too causes anatomical and physiologic changes in the heart. First, since blood that should be in the aorta sort of falls back into the ventricle, you will often notice a very low diastolic pressure and wide pulse pressure. When you see a normal systolic pressure and a ridiculously low diastolic pressure, consider that your patient may have AI. Also, when blood backs up into the left ventricle, over time, that extra volume starts to stretch out the ventricle, much like how a balloon expands when it's overfilled. If the balloon ventricle starts to stretch too much, this will impair its ability to contract forcefully, and you wind up with systolic heart failure. This becomes a vicious cycle where more fluid worsens contractility, which worsens fluid, which worsens contractility in perpetuity until something is done to disrupt this cycle. Additional upstream consequences of this dilated, overfilled ventricle is that the mitral valve will start to get stretched open. So now you also have developed mitral valve regurgitation secondary to AI. Once both of these gates remain continuously open, now you have an unobstructive path backwards into the lungs. This is where you start to get fluid overload and pulmonary hypertension, and then consequently right-sided heart failure. Since fluid struggles to move forward, AI is essentially a condition of fluid overload. These patients will greatly benefit from diuresis. Another tactic to keep the ventricle from overfilling is maintaining a higher heart rate. Bradycardia is bad as it allows more time for the ventricle to overfill. The other really bad state that worsens AI is hypertension or elevated systemic vascular resistance. Remember that blood is going to move from areas of higher pressure to lower pressure. If you have a high SVR, it's going to push more blood backwards through the incompetent valve. And this is why an intraaortic balloon pump is totally contraindicated in AI. That balloon will stuff the ventricle with blood like a turkey on Thanksgiving Day. Now that you're familiar with the pathophysiology of both AS and AI, you can probably intuit some of the treatments needed for each. In AS, we know that we have a thick myocardium with decreased filling capacity, elevated ventricular pressures, normal contractility, altered pressure gradients, and AFib and tachycardia are bad. So for AS, we want to ensure we have adequate preload by giving fluids cautiously. Give small boluses gradually until you reach your hemodynamic goals. In order to maintain adequate coronary perfusion pressures, we need to increase our systemic blood pressure with vasopressors. Since our systolic function is generally preserved, Phenylephrine is probably the ideal choice in this situation. Phenylephrine also has the benefit of not increasing the heart rate or increasing the likelihood of dysrhythmias, for which we know both are bad. If AFib does develop, it's important to not only rate control, but also try to rhythm control with amiodarone or cardioversion to preserve that much needed atrial kick. For AI, we know we have a dilated, fluid overloaded ventricle with poor contractility in later stages, secondary mitral valve changes, fluid backing up into the lungs and right heart, and bradycardia and hypertension are bad. So for AI, we want to not give fluids and probably diurese the hell out of them, but gently. Even though the patient's BP might look scary low, it's because the heart can't adequately pump from being too congested.
Diuresis will fix the congestion and allow for better systolic function and subsequently a better blood pressure. To additionally support contractility and forward flow, we want to use inotropes. The most ideal inotrope in this situation would be dobutamine. Remember, dobutamine is an inodilator that also increases chronotropy. We said that bradycardia and hypertension are bad, so dobutamine is an excellent choice to increase systolic function as well as increase the heart rate and decrease the SVR. One drug that beautifully hits all three of our goals in managing AI. Remember that these medical management strategies are just general recommendations and may not apply to every patient. Patients are highly complex and require individualized care to address any special nuances. For example, some patients can have both aortic stenosis and insufficiency simultaneously. And so for anyone who has to treat that patient, good luck. Just a quick mention, in patients with severe AS or AI, the definitive treatment would be a valve replacement surgery, but the topic of open heart surgeries will have to wait for a future video. I hope you enjoy learning about the complicated topic of aortic valve pathology. Please like this video and share it with your friends so they can be smart like you. Don't be shysty with the knowledge. I want all nurses to be at the top of their game. Thanks for watching and I hope you will join me in my next video. See you all next time.